always want to welcome you and thank you guys for coming and uh, those that listen online to us, we just appreciate so much. Hope it can be an encouragement to you in your Christian life. We have been for about four or five weeks studying about Jacob in the book of Genesis. Now we come to the story about uh, Joseph and his life. And I think we're going to have five lessons that will deal with this. We've been looking at families in the book of Genesis. And this is Jesus Christ. This is his ancestry. These are the patriarchs of the Old Testament. They're the ones that founded the nation of Israel. We studied about Jacob and God changed his name to Israel. And we know that he was, this country was named after him and they have their roots and we have our Christian roots in, in this group of people. I, I think God instituted families and they play such an important role. And if you've been in a good family, you understand that. Uh, if you haven't been in a good family, hopefully you've been in a good church family because you find that there are people there that love you and care for you. They don't have motives to just love you. They just love you in the Lord. And so this family, as we look at this, uh, I want to remind you, this is, has been such a dysfunctional family. You would think that the family of, of Jesus, his ancestors, well, maybe they're a special group or their special behavior, but we'll find that this was a pretty wicked group. And one of the things I, I love when I read that, it gives us all hope that in our failures, failure is not final, is it? Thank goodness. And uh, we can be forgiven of our sins. We can be restored in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't give up on us. These men uh, are going to find their place in God's economy and God's family. And uh, let's just begin to look at it. Joseph, let me tell you a little bit about Joseph. Well, uh, there are many in the Old Testament, his brothers, there are so many bad things that are given about him. Uh, I, I, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Reuben and Judah, they were both had incest problems. We look at Simeon and Levi. We looked at that in the rape of their sister. And they took the sword, the Bible says, went into that town and that community. They killed every man with the sword. Hundreds of them, folks. And they took their wives and their families. And this is a little bit about this family. And we know because we've studied Joseph before, uh, and when we were kids in uh, Sunday school, that uh, they sold him into slavery. We know how they treated him. So we get a glimpse into this family. But Joseph is so different. The Bible doesn't really speak anything bad about Joseph. Kind of unusual. And when you look at him, I think as we go through this, you're going to see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at this, there's so many things that relate to that. We've talked about in the Old Testament and then the New Testament, and one of the things that uh, you will find is the things that are concealed in the Old Testament many times are revealed in the New Testament. Let me just give you one example, okay, outside of this. We know the story of Jonah, don't we? How long did Jonah stay in the belly of the whale? Three days. We read that three days. That doesn't sound like too much. We come to the New Testament, and Jesus said this. He answered, but he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. You see, God had a purpose for that story. That story was more than just a story of a fish. It was a prophecy. It was a picture that Jesus Christ was going to come. He was going to spend three days in the tomb. And so as you read so many of these things, you begin to look at them in the New Testament, and we've talked about the ark. We've talked about all those pictures that God paints, and then we see it, and I think one of the most revealing is that when Abraham offered Isaac. That was a picture of what God was going to do with his son on Calvary, except he was not going to spare his son like he spared Isaac. 
And so as we look at this, we begin to see this family. I want to begin, I think your quarterly starts in about verse 5. I want to begin in the beginning of that chapter. Now Jacob dwelled in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the land that Abraham was promised. Jacob has, remember he had gone to Laban. He's finally come back home and he's dwelling there. And this is a history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brother. And the lad was with the sons of Bela and the sons of Zippa and his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them to his father. Now, this is the beginning of the resentment of his brothers, okay? Joseph was treated differently. We've talked about this. We talked about it, how Isaac and Rebekah treated Esau and Jacob different. And we talked about how some of these traits just seem to hang on to our family until somebody breaks the cycle. And uh, we see that in this next verse, now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and also made for him a tunic of many colors. You know, his feelings was one thing, but when he took action and he made a difference in that son that was visible to everybody and to those other sons, that was a problem. We talked about that in this story of Genesis, how as parenting, it is essential that we uh, understand that so many of these things will bring a problem to our family. They'll bring difficulty that will last sometimes more than one generation. And then this next verse says, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more, and it's not going to be concealed in a family, folks. There's not many secrets in a family, is it? You know and you see all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably into him. It started with jealousy. Jealousy is when we, somebody has something that we don't. They have a privilege that we don't. They have a special place that we don't. And we envy that and we want that. And it began with jealousy and it has progressed. And now it's turned to hatred. When you look at the spectrum, you have love here and you have hatred here. And what does love do? Love brings us together. Love will bind us together. Hatred will separate us. It will, depart, it will cause all kinds of problems in this family. And, and Jacob, you would think he would have learned that lesson because he was a victim of that lesson, but he has not. Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. It seems like when this progression starts, Joseph can't do anything right because anything that he does, his brothers are going to look at it in the light of his father, how... His father loves him and through jealousy and through hatred, and so he has a dream. Now, the Bible doesn't speak evil about Joseph, but uh, this is the only thing that I have a question about, whether he was, uh, he, remember, he's 17 years old, and he tells these dreams to his brothers. And we look at this and say, he might have been better off if he had kept that to himself, but he didn't, and let's look at what happened. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, when behold, my sheaf rose and stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. Now, sometimes you can go and see if corn, they'll take corn stalks and tie them together. That's a sheaf. It can be wheat. It can be all kinds of things. Joseph said there, all of us had one. Mine stood up in the middle of the field, and all of yours, they bowed down and, and to the sheep. Now, what do you think these brothers felt when they heard that? I mean, this is like pouring gasoline on a fire, isn't it? They don't, they don't want to hear that. And so the, they hated him even more because of this. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? Well, one day he is. One day he is, but that's not what they want to hear. And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So Joseph uh, kind of innocently just tells him the dream. And these two dreams, he has two dreams, kind of direct Joseph's life. It really reveals to him a little bit about the purpose of what God is going to do with him. He doesn't know directly. But these dreams, as he goes to Egypt, we know he interprets dreams. He interpreted dreams for, 
for the two men in prison. He interpreted dreams for Pharaoh. And I have an idea that uh, Joseph knows that there's going to be something in his life that God has for him. You know, sometimes I think when we think about our lives and we come to places in our life where we want to be used of God and we understand and we've been taught. I've tried to teach it in this class that God has a purpose for you. You're not an accident. God didn't just create you for nothing. He has a work. He has a design. He has a plan. And the, the Bible just keeps on reminding us that God created us and loves us and has something for us to do. And we all kind of wrestle with that. And when we look at Joseph, he is such a positive example of how we deal with that. You see, we're going to look, and in just a few minutes, adversity is going to come. Trouble's going to come. He's not going to see anything. He's going to be in darkness. He's going to be left in darkness. It's pretty easy when things are good to worship the Lord. As a matter of fact, I'm going to, I'm going to bet more people find God in adversity than they do in prosperity. Amen? We all know that. It's when, the, it's when the bottom falls out that we start looking for God. But in our prosperity, when we're being blessed, it's hard. And one of the things about Joseph, you're going to see a consistency through the bad times. And then finally, the good times come. And we see his character doesn't change through all that. And then let's look. He had another dream. This one's not in your quarterly. He dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. And said, look, I have dreamed another dream. This time, the sun and the moon, and the 11 stars. Wonder why 11 stars, not 10, not 12. Well, they're 12 brothers. That means his 11 brothers, okay? And what happens this time? And the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his fathers and his brothers, and his father rebuked him, saying, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down on the earth before you? And his brothers, look at this, envy him. They're, they're jealous. They've hated him. And now this envy, what is that? That's when we wish that we had what they have. We envy what somebody else wants. Listen, it's one of the tools of the devil that he will use on us in our, in our life to distract us from worshiping God, to get us off track, and it'll bring all kinds of trouble into our life. So he envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. So we begin to see here the stories developing. We see a little bit about Joseph. We see about this family relationship. And I just want to mention, I've jotted down a couple of things that we'll see in Joseph. First of all, he, his purpose. These dreams help him to know he has a purpose and he stays faithful to that. His, we see his faithfulness. We're going to see his endurance. We're going to see his courage. We're going to see his devotion to God. We're going to see his character and that's going to be tested. And then we'll see his faith, and we'll see his reliance on his God. So as we look at this, what happened? Well, the next couple of verses, then the brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. So he said, Here I am. And then he said to him, Please go and see if it's well with your brothers and well with the flock and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron unto Shechem. Now there was a certain man found him, and where, there he was in the field wandering, and the man asked him, what are you seeking? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. And he tells him that they're in Dotham. Now he's traveled about 50 or 60 miles. This is not just walking out in the backyard, okay? He's traveled 50 or 60 miles, most likely on foot, probably a couple days journey to get to where his brothers are. And then we pick up where your quarterly is. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, <clears throat> they conspired against him to kill him. Do you see the progression of what's happened? A difference has been made and there's envy and there's jealousy and there's hatred and then we come to this place to where they conspired. Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. He taught us uh, something that was so different from what the old prophets taught. The old prophets taught, if you do this, you know, if you, this is a sin, don't do this. Jesus took it so much farther. He said, listen, what you think 
The Bible says is a, a tremendous statement. He says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our thoughts are going to determine who we are and it determines our action. And Jesus dealt with that and he dealt with the fact, remember he talked about murder, he talked about adultery, and he defined them this way. You don't have to shoot anybody. You don't have to have an adulterous affair. All you have to do is have the thought in your mind and entertain that thought and you're guilty of that sin. Well, you see, these brothers, this, this sin of this attitude has started a long time ago, and it's not been dealt with. And can I tell you, that's what will happen to our mind if we don't deal with those thoughts and those things that are in our mind. The devil puts them there. My mother, I, I used to love what she said. She said, you can't help, you know, that a bird flies over your head, but you can help if he builds a nest in your head. And that's the idea that we have to deal with this. These brothers, they just lived in that. The Bible in the book, I think it's Ephesians, maybe Paul's writing, where he talked about bitterness, a root of bitterness. It starts as a root, and then it grows. Mason and I were pulling some weeds, and you know what? Some of those weeds, if you don't pull every last one of them up, you know what's going to happen? They're going to come back, aren't they? And that root, you have to get to the root of it. And, and that bitterness grows, and it will just, it will just destroy us. Uh, C.S. Lewis one time, I don't know if you've read any of his writing. He wrote Mere Christianity. He was a great uh, doctor, a Christian author, and you listen to many of the preachers today that they'll refer to his writings and some of the things that he did. But there was, in, in Cambridge, there was a group of professors that were sitting around the table, and they were discussing about all the differences in religion and they uh, were discussing how this one has this and well this one has this element in it too and uh, C.S. Lewis walked in the room and they said Dr. Lewis what is the difference in Christianity versus all the other religions what's the difference and he said the difference is really easy the difference is forgiveness God forgives and you see, that's going to be the picture that we're going to see through this story is it's not that these people are perfect, but God can offer forgiveness and he can change lives and he can change our heart, our mind, and our attitude. And just as, will you remember the lesson we had when Jacob wrestled at Peniel? And he, we, we talked about the fact that that battle was a, a battle against himself. And the problem was Jacob had always run his life. He'd got everything that he had gotten. He'd gotten it the wrong way. And he came in a wrestling match with this angel. And what happened when he finally came to himself, he figured out what all of us have to figure out, folks. The Bible said, and Paul says, he says, I was crucified with Christ. But nevertheless, I still live. But he said, not me. Not me. See, he had a wrestling match too. It, we come to the place to where we have to give up the things that are important to us, the things and the ambitions and desires we have, and they have to become what God wants for us. We look at this story and it happened, seems like, very easily for Jacob. I mean, for Joseph, Jacob had to wrestle about that. And most of us have to <coughs> wrestle about that. And so they conspired. Look at it. Then they said one to another, the dreamer is coming. Come therefore and let us now kill him and cast him in the pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Wow, what a family. What a group of men. Here they are. I mean, you just, the pages of the Bible just open up. You see their heart, the evilness. And they're ready to kill Joseph. And look at what happens. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into the pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, <coughs> that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Reuben at least showed a little bit of mercy and good sense, and he thought, Well, let's throw him in the pit. And I'll come back at a later time and I'll get him and deliver him to his father. But uh, the story doesn't end there. And we look at these brothers, they, uh, they have more intentions than that. Look at this next verse, verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic 
It, the tunic of many colors that was on him. They've been waiting. They've been waiting to get their hands on that because that is the object that they relate to their father showing such a difference. You know, you know what? I, I just see this and I see that probably in our family that people relate certain things to the differences we make. It was this, this coat of many colors and they couldn't wait to get a hold of that and to destroy that and take it off. And then they cast, took him and cast him into the pit and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. Well, this is a hot day. This is a hot environment. There's no water and they, there he is in that pit. And I looked at this and the scripture doesn't give it all to us right here, but listen to this next verse. And they sat down to eat a meal and they lifted their eyes and behold and look a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. <coughs> they throw him in the pit folks and they're going to leave him there to die. And they sat down and eat a meal. I, I, there's a couple of verses over, a couple of chapters over. Let me read you this. And this is later on when the brothers finally go to Egypt and they're under conviction because all their things are falling apart in their life, here's what they remember. Verse 21, For they said one to another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore this distress has come upon us. You see, when he's in that pit, this verse of scripture just goes right on. But you can imagine what's happened. He's begging. He's pleading. They're sitting down and eating, and he's in the pit. Have they gotten cold-hearted? Cold-hearted. Folks, sin is progressive, isn't it? It gets in our life, and it gets worse and worse and worse, and it will take us down a road that, uh, that we don't want to go on, and it will cost us a lot. These brothers how far they've uh, gone. <coughs> and they sat down to eat a meal, and then they lifted their eyes and looked. There was a company of the Ishmaelites. These are descendants of Ishmael. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let our hand be, let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brothers listen have enough good thought to think he's our brother we shouldn't kill him but look at what they're doing i mean they're doing it's only an act of god that he doesn't die and then the midianite traders passed by so the brothers pulled joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver and they took joseph to egypt <clears throat> well, here's a man that has dreams, 17 years old, has a lot of ambition. He thinks God has a purpose for his life. And we don't see anything bad yet. And we know as we go a little farther in the story, he maintained his integrity. He maintained his faith in God. But he's in a dark place right now, isn't he? I, every time I teach, I'm made aware that there are people that are in that position in their life. They're in the dark time. There are times, sometimes, folks, when we can't see the sunshine. It's, it's cloudy over our life. Sometimes it's family issues. Sometimes it's personal issues. But Satan has his work and does his job on all of us, doesn't he? And life itself, the Bible says it's full of briars and thorns. And life at its very best has troubles and temptations and problems. And when we look at Joseph, I don't know about you, the times that I've been down in my life, and, and I can't see, sometimes we want to panic, don't we? I mean, we just feel like God has deserted us and he's left us. And, and Jacob, what we see here, that his faith is stronger than the obstacles that he's facing. And that's the key in the success of life, isn't it? When we understand that God is bigger than our problems, J Jesus in the New Testament talked about that, and the writer in the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Our faith can carry us through. And I look at this and I say there are people that are suffering and there are people that are troubled. You go outside of this church and, you know, we come to church and we usually talk pretty positive about things and we try to be a good example to those around us. 
But you just go out there and listen to some people's stories and listen to the difficulties that they've been when you ask them how you are and they begin to get serious and they tell you the troubles that they have. And listen, folks, I'm reminded that that's why Jesus Christ came. That's why he's here. That's the difference in having him in our life is that when we go through these times that we can persevere, that we can continue on because he's faithful to the end. And we know that he is looking after us. I love those passages that remind us he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's not going to give up on us, folks. When I look at this family right here, I see a lot of reason God should have given up on these 12 men. He should have given up. He, they had plenty of reasons to give up. But listen, what God is fixing to do, I'm going to give you a little advertisement for the next lessons, okay? What God is fixing to do, he's fixing to bring these 11 men to themselves just like he brought Jacob to himself. And he's going to mold them and he's going to make them and he's going to use Joseph to do that. Now, if Joseph is not faithful, if Joseph does not keep his head up, if he doesn't persevere, I'm going to tell you what, this whole family is going to perish. That's what's going to happen. They're all going to be lost. But thank goodness that the Bible pictures this. And I told you earlier in the New Testament, there's a parallel to that and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to see what Christ did for us, Joseph did for his brothers. He offered redemption to them. He offered forgiveness for them. He restored them. He took care of them. And, and we look at this, and it's a reminder to us, folks, God has called you for a purpose. I don't know what your purpose is, but you just be faithful. And when you don't know and you can't see and you don't understand, you just keep on being faithful. That word be still in the Bible, I believe doesn't mean be still and do nothing. It's just be still and wait until the Lord shows you something else. Stay right where you are and be faithful where you are until he shows you something else in your life. I'm so glad there's some good examples. I'm glad there's people in the Bible, most of them are pictured just like me and you with a lot of faults. And I'm sure Joseph had his faults. But the Bible, Bible gives us a picture here that we can live above our circumstances, folks. There's a power that's greater in this world that can help us to be overcomers and not victims. I look at Joseph there so many times he could have been a victim. He could have cried out. He could have felt sorry for himself. But he understood God had a purpose. God had a reason for that. It helps me to understand. I don't always know the purpose, but I know God's in control, isn't he? He's in control of my life. And he's in control of your life. And thank goodness that he's faithful to us as his children. Let's bow for our prayer. Lord, you have uh, throughout my life been so faithful to me. And there's been so many times that I couldn't see. I just couldn't see. I was in darkness. And thank goodness that you're there with us during those times. And you work with us and you help us in our relationship to begin to see. And you help to build that faith so that we can hold on. Lord, I just know there are people that are going through struggles and trials, and I just pray that they would look at this example of Joseph and that it would increase their faith, that it would make them uh, understand that you haven't given up on them and you're not thrown in the towel on them, but there is a purpose, and God, you're faithful to complete that. I love that verse in Philippians that tells us that he, he that began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, it reminds us of your faithfulness in dealing with us. Lord, I thank you for this class, and I thank you for just their faithfulness and their walk with the Lord, and I pray for their families. I pray for Matt as he goes to uh, his vocation. I pray that you would be with him. I, I know he can be a great blessing and a great witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the time that he's been here with us. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. Bless our pastor and the service that follows. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.